If you're one of the participants in our Stop Smoking program, I have a hunch you're suffering some severe withdrawal symptoms right now. Join us in this program and you'll see hundreds of others going through the same process. I'm Dr. Arthur Weaver, a cancer surgeon. We're going to see you through this first difficult day and I know you can make it. that since you were here last night, 1,000 people died of prematurely of diseases associated with smoking since you were here last night in the United States alone. That's basically three loads of 747s. What do you think would happen if we had a 747 go down today and it crashed and 350 plus people were killed? And then tomorrow we had a 747 crash. And the following day we had a 747 crash. You remember a few plane accidents you've heard about, the Korean accident, the Detroit accident, the like? People talk about those for years later. Well, since you were here last night, we've had three times that many people die from diseases associated with smoking. We lost perhaps 50,000 men in Vietnam. We consider that a disaster. We lose a third of a million, over a third of a million people every year in the United States, prematurely, from diseases associated with smoking. And I work down where the bridge is out. That's why I'm glad to see you back. Some of you suffer a little bit? Anybody suffer? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. But it's worth it. It's worth it to keep you out of this crash, okay? Let's look at it that way. Well, now I see some people here. Let's start with this young lady right here. Why don't you come on up? Now, I should tell you that we have chosen these people randomly from the audience. My friend, uh, Lloyd, I ask him, go and get me four people. Don't ask them any questions. So it's as big a surprise to me as it will be to you. Give us your first name. Debbie. Debbie, how much are you used to smoking? Um, I'm not smoking a lot right now. I came to your class last year, uh -huh. and I was great for six months, and I've been cheating for the last six months. And you decided to do I it right this time. cut it all out. Yeah, I'm probably smoking. How much are you, when you're smoking greatly, how much were you smoking? Yeah, about a pack a day. Pack a day. How did the day go for you? Fine. I haven't had any trouble. I'm, I'm mentally, <laughs> I'm mentally ready. You think that I makes a difference? I just need some help. Yes. Do you have any symptoms at all? No. No, I'm, I'm kept busy. <laughs> you don't want to hear that, do you? Well, why not I just, keep busy? I just kept real busy and um, stayed away from the coffee. You and know, you got to stay away from and alcohol kind, and coffee. you're kind of proud of yourself. Yes. Shall we give Debbie a big hand? <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's have this gentleman right here. Would you care to give us your first name? Don. Don. How much are you used to smoking, Don? Uh, two packs a day. How long have you been doing that? Uh, over 25 years. What made you decide that this was the appropriate time to quit? Uh, I think just the fact that it was the beginning of the year and I saw the write-up for your seminar and figured I tried it in the past myself, maybe with some little help, some you... help that maybe I'd be able to do it this time. And how did the last 24 hours go for you? They were hell. Do you want to develop that a little bit for me? Well, uh, my wife and I both are coming, and I thought it better that we didn't talk on the way here this evening. <laughs> I left work two hours early, and 
it would. What symptoms do you think you had? Okay. Well, why would you describe the, you, the, your feelings today? Well, I've got this numbness in my joints. <laughs> I'm all sweaty. Uh, I couldn't concentrate. Anybody else here can't concentrate? Mm -hmm. I should tell you that of all the symptoms and signs that people tell me about, the inability to stick to a thought pattern or a job process is probably the commonest of all withdrawal symptoms. I remember I was putting on a stop smoking clinic in Plymouth not so long ago. And there was a fellow there who worked for Burroughs, the computer company. He came back the first day and he said, boy, did my company lose money on me today. <laughs> he said, I couldn't even read the diagrams, let alone fix a computer. He came back the second day and I said, how did it go? <coughs> Forget it. He says, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> he came back the third day. I said, how are you doing? Well, he said, I read the diagrams today. He came back the fourth day. He said, I fixed three computers. I think I'll keep my job. But if you find trouble sticking with it, I think this is probably the commonest symptom that people have when they, when they quit smoking. Anything else bothers you? Uh, actually, I didn't have any urges to smoke. I not, didn't have any. I only had a couple. Uh -huh. uh, but you felt terrible. Yeah, but I felt terrible. Uh -huh. So I don't know whether it was the lack of cigarettes, the lack of food, or running to the, to the uh, men's room all day. <laughs> Something did it. But you didn't smoke. You didn't smoke. Well, you know, where's that girl that I just talked to? Because I failed to give her her button. I have here tonight, for everybody who hasn't smoked since last night, or the last 24 hours, I love being free from smoke. Maybe we ought to practice, warm up on that one a little bit. Shall we say? I love being free from smoke. There's your button. We'll send that young lady back here, and I'll personally uh, give her her button. Why don't you come on up here? Okay, hi. And your first name? Mary. Mary. How much are you used to smoking? A uh, pack, two a pack and a half a day. And uh, you thought this was a good time to get at it? Any, any special oh. reason that you... I've been, I've been wanting to quit for a couple of years and keep procrastinating and trying. And it's an easy thing to put off, isn't it? Sure yeah. is. And I have kids who, who desperately want me to quit smoking. They probably love their mother. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so how did the last 24 hours go for you? Um, it wasn't too, too bad. Um, what was the worst thing you noticed? I couldn't concentrate at work either, and, um, and I'm real anxious. Just feel really, really anxious. Kind of uptight? Yeah, just... A little real, irritable? A little snappy. <laughs> <laughs> but you made it? Yes. Without a cigarette? Without a cigarette at all. Aren't you proud of her? Let's give her a button. Thank you. Thank you very much. Come on up, sir. Oh, look what he's got on here. Uh, did you uh, wear that on purpose? Well, yes, I have to admit that I did. I, and, uh, I'm not a happy camper. Well, <laughs> What's your name? My name is Rory. And how much are you used to smoking, Rory? Uh, about two packs a day. And uh, how'd the day go for you? Uh, I have to admit, I cannot get my pin tonight. I uh -huh. did smoke two cigarettes today. You smoked two cigarettes. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about those two cigarettes. What, uh, I mean, uh, how much, you're used to smoking two packs? Correct. That's 40 cigarettes a day. And 38 times you said, I love being free from smoking. <laughs> And two times you said, nuts to it. <laughs> I thought I felt bad before I smoked them, but, man, I had to lay down. I smoked one cigarette, and I had, I had to lay down, and I got up and immediately smoked the second one right there. And that was it. That was the end of the cigarettes. Uh, you remember that big pile of stuff we had here last night? Uh, uh, where'd those two cigarettes come from? <laughs> I found them at home, and I went out of my way to go home today because I knew I found them there last night when I went home, and I didn't throw them away. And I went out of my when way When you didn't today. throw away, what were you saying? I'm a wimp. <laughs> I was here last year, and I made it 
almost six months. And uh, I think, honestly, it, today was easier than last year at this time. Okay. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that he kept those two cigarettes around? Uh, it's not unusual at a clinic, to be honest with you. I find someone comes along and uh, they say, Doctor, oh, I had a terrible time today. Well, how much do you smoke? <laughs> Two cigarettes. They come back the second day. Oh, Doctor, I had a terrible time today. How much do you smoke? Well, I smoke one and a half <laughs> cigarettes. And I say, where did you get the cigarettes? Out of my purse. Now, when you leave the cigarettes around, what are you saying? I'm going to keep them here just in case. You know what? There'll always be a case. And you know what? He had a worse day because of those two cigarettes than he would have had if he hadn't had any cigarettes. Because now I've got to start over again. Yep. Well, I believe you're going to. At 1.30 tomorrow afternoon, I'll be looking for you to get one of those pins right there. <laughs> 1.30 in the afternoon. Well, that'll be your 24 that'll hours. That'll be my 24 hours. S see if you can find me. <laughs> well, I've got your number. <laughs> <laughs> and I got your work number. Yeah. And your beeper number. So I should probably share this bit of message with you. So you understand why, why, why I'm here, basically. Tomorrow after, Tomorrow, I have... I'll be lucky if I get here on time tomorrow night, to be honest with you. I have a fellow who has a cancer involving his voice box, his throat, the lymph nodes in his neck. We're going to have to take out his voice box, take out all of his throat beyond his tongue, bring a piece of intestine up to replace his throat, hook that up with microscopic anastomosis and hope, by the grace of God, we can pull them through. The operation is good for probably 10 or 12 hours. Unfortunately, I have an associate who may take over about the time I have to come to this clinic. But uh, think about that tomorrow. I will. And um, you think he'll make it tomorrow? Yeah. Let's I'll be wearing this again tomorrow. Well, yeah, that's good. Okay, let's, let's just, for the fun of it, is there anybody here that smokes four packs of cigarettes a day? Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody see any hands up? Three packs of cigarettes a day? All right, let's take this man right back here. Come on up here. Just walk right on up here because I know if somebody comes up here and says, well, I smoke a half pack of cigarettes a day, we say, well, no wonder. Well, we'll talk, so there's some real smokers here now. Somebody that really gets down at it, who works hard at it. Hi, what's your name? Uh, my name is Fred. Fred, how much are you smoking? About three packs a day. You know, how long have you been doing that, Fred? Um, well, uh, let's see here. You know, 20, 30 years, 30 years maybe. And I, uh, I don't know if I smoked that many but, uh, 20 years ago. But, but you've been, you've been kind of growing on you a little bit. Yeah. And... Um, you were here last night because I remember you. Right. And uh, how did your day go? Well, I didn't make it. You didn't make it? No. Tell us about it. Well, let's see. I made it until about um, maybe 10 o'clock this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I was reading that, uh, that little book that you gave us, or that little thing that you passed out today, the, the, the uh, sheet of paper. And... Um, and it was a trigger. And, and where I smoke the most is at work and the stress of work and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, I, and I did real well until I get there. <laughs> and the, so the trigger sort of tripped you off. Yeah. So how much did you smoke today? Probably about five cigarettes. Now, what are we going to do about that between now and tomorrow? Well, I quit smoking. <laughs> uh, you think you can make it? Yeah, I think I can make it, yeah. How many of you think you can make it? <laughs> Why don't you give him a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody here that smoked three packs of cigarettes a day before they came and made it today? Let me see your hand. Oh, why don't you come up, sir? Let's talk to someone who, who made it, huh? That's good. 
He's staggering as he comes, but... Okay, well, he, he's, uh, he's, uh, hey, look here, he's, he's, he's patriotic and all that. What's your name? Ron. Ron. So you're a three-pack a day? I was a three-pack. You was a three... And I, I, I cheated. I started, I started early. I started Thursday. Oh, that's okay. I started the last Thursday, and I haven't had a cigarette since. Now, that's what you call getting on the ball, isn't it? And uh, uh, so today was a little better than some not, of the other guests. Uh, now, tell them a little bit. Uh, let's, let's go back to Friday, then. How was Friday for you? Hell. Because <laughs> that's where most of these people are. No, it was uh, it was rough. It was no, because yeah, I uh, how could you say? Yeah, I kept going to the men's bathroom and uh, doing doing, and I tried to. You'd go for a pack of cigarettes. You try to grab, and you get no cigarettes. You don't have a cigarette in your uh, you don't have a cigarette in your shirt. You're trying to grab, and there's nothing there. And after a while, I just got used to that. There's not, nothing going to be nothing there from now on. So. Today you're feeling a little better. A lot better. A lot better. Yeah, because you see, I should tell you. So it would be up front. For some people, the first day is the worst day. For most people, actually, the first day is the worst day. Now, just stop to think about that. Most of you have put in the worst day. Give yourself a hand. That was a, that was a, that's a, that's a good effort. For some people, the second day is the worst. Fewer. For a few people, the third day is the worst. But let me tell you this. No one ever told me that the fourth day was the worst. So. Figure this way, those three terrible days, if you've been off 24 hours, you've already put in a third of your labor, okay? And you're going to deliver this, baby. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to be proud of yourself in just about two days hence, and you're going to start to feel a lot better. Yeah, and you're already kind of coming into that right, phase. Yes. And I'm downright proud of you. Thank you. Let's give me your, your button. Thank you, thank you That's great. Let's give that man a hand. Right now, I'd like to take a few minutes to answer any questions you might have about things you've been through or things you're feeling. Now, I should tell you this, so that we can make it good for the video and the like. What I'd like you to do is to stand. And as soon as they get there with the uh, camera, We'll ask you a question. Please don't fail to stand if you have a question, okay? We're going to forget all about the video and this kind of stuff, because I want to help you. And I know that there's a great number of you that have had some problems or questions about what you're going through. So who's the first one? Stand right up and, uh, yeah, stand. All right, here's one right over. Bring the camera over. And then you stand right up. We'll get you, too, because we want to ask, we want to ask these, um, we want to ask these questions. All right, we're going to start with this young lady. Yes. Um, I was wondering about friends. Most of my friends smoke. Should I abandon them or tell them I'll see them in five months or what? No, I think, I think that's a very valid question. And I should tell you that it may make a difference in your friends. I'll, I'll be up front with you because most people who quit smoking feel uncomfortable around smokers. And many smokers feel uncomfortable around non-smokers. So there may be a shift, but at least while you're getting off. I would say, basically, try to stay away from the smokers if possible. Now, if your spouse smokes or something like that, you may not be able to do that. But you'll find it helpful, particularly for the first three or four days while you're going through situation. Uh, stick, I'm sure you have some friends that don't smoke. Yeah. Yeah, this is not the time to go to the bar. You got it? <laughs> this is not the time. Stay away from the smokers as much as possible. And when you look at them, this is what's so important. When you look at the smoker, it's what you say to yourself that counts. If you look at them and you say, oh, man, isn't that too bad? Look at those people destroying themselves. Boy, am I glad that I'm not smoking. I love being free from smoking, you see. Okay. If, on the other hand, you look at them and you say, oh, boy, would I love to have a cigarette right now. You see what that's going to do to you? All right, now there was a lady right over here. Let's get, let's get her. Yes? I was wondering about the severe headache from caffeine withdrawal. How long is that going to last? Yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely correct that it could be from caffeine withdrawal, although you can have it from um, 
nicotine withdrawal too. Like and certainly right on the, the top color of my head, like feels a like your head is stuck in a vice. Yes, exactly. I should tell you, and I will before we're through tonight, that the commonest cause of headaches is caffeine. It can give you a headache on the rise. It can give you a headache on the fall. More commonly, the fall. The headache will not be here more than three days. If you want to take something for it, do not take a caffeine-containing drug, such as anison or <laughs> APCs or something like that. It'll relieve the headache, but it'll keep the pattern going. So take a bufferin or aspirin or something okay. like that if you have to, okay? Go ahead. I've been to acupuncture twice and it didn't help. Now I was thinking of hypnosis. You think, in your professional opinion, it would help? Well, whatever works helps, but let's just take a little survey here. How many people here have been hypnotized to try to help them stop smoking? <laughs> well, that's quite a few of you. How many have had acupuncture to help them quit smoking? All right, let me suggest this to you. And this probably is based a great deal on my experience. I had a couple actually come to my stop smoking clinic not long ago and they told me they'd been to some doctor who put injections in the nose. Cost $350 for the injections. They said, we went to the doctor, we gave him a check for $700. We walked out and had a cigarette on our way to the car. <laughs> now, I'm sure that there's a great many of you here would like to come in and have me say, abacadabra. You came in here wanting a cigarette and you're going to leave not wanting a cigarette. Fact is, you'll hate cigarettes. And for some people, it works. But the numbers are pretty small, I must be honest with you, where it lasts. Those people who come to our program, and I'm brag a little bit here maybe, do better than any other program that I know of or have ever tested. And we've evaluated this at some considerable length. And I think the reason is that we try to help you make decisions for yourself and when you do it for yourself you understand it's not something I apply to you I just try to facilitate your decisions and when you leave here you see I didn't make you stop smoking you made yourselves stop smoking now let me make some suggestions for you that we didn't even have time to get how, how many anybody here that's hungry And I, I should probably explain to you why we put you on that fruit juice diet, right? There's several reasons. Number one, have you heard of the gateway theory of neurology? That basically says your, your mind can really only concentrate on one thing at a time. And if you're hungry, you know what you're thinking about? Your stomach. You know what that'll help you not think so much about? Now you fill your stomach and immediately you're going to start thinking about cigarettes. But when you're hungry, you see, it sort of distracts your mind so that you're thinking about food, food, food. And it helps you forget about cigarettes, cigarettes, cigarettes. Not only that, most of you are used to having a cigarette with your coffee, huh? Or Coke or whatever it is, your drug that, that, that you have it with there together. And when, but very few people smoke when they're drinking fruit juice. Did you notice that? One lady said to me, uh, doctor, do you mind if I drink my fruit juice through a straw? She says, there's something about sucking on that straw that res relieves an old urge. So there's a lot of techniques that'll help you. But do not forget the spiritual. Everyone who works with addictions recognizes that somehow we need to pull in everything that we can, even from outside ourselves. I've, I've discovered that myself. Let me get this over here just a little bit. And when I had a problem, you know, that I had to conquer, 
Maybe sometime I'll tell you about the almond joys and my problem with them. But um, I've discovered from my own personal experience that if I'll make the decision, put my will in it, and then I'll ask the good God, who I believe cares about me as a person, even the nitty-gritty of my life, that he'll provide the power for me to see that accomplished. I've, I've put that down as the ABCs. <coughs> ask, believe, and claim the victory, huh? You think you could try that? Someone once took, I saw a, a poster and it said the shortest prayer. You know what it said on it? Help! <laughs> and when you feel desperate, and they're, you know, you've tried all the 16 things and you've, anybody snapped their rubber band? <laughs> Just offer up that prayer to the good Lord and say, give me power for the next hour, huh? And uh, I think you'll find it'll make a tremendous difference. You know, people who work with narcotics have found that out. People who work with alcoholics have found that out. And uh, I think you'll find it works just as well for nicotine. Now, I want to explain to you a little bit about the coffee. I heard some complaining about that. I heard a lot of complaining about that. Um, the fact is, there was one stop smoking clinic I, I was putting on, and uh, I started talking about caffeine, and, and, and I saw a fellow sliding lower and lower and lower in his seat. And I said, is there a problem, sir? He said, indeed, there's a very serious problem. He says, I can't get out of bed without my cup of coffee in the morning. I said, uh, you mean that you have your wife get up and make coffee? So you can get up, no, 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 he said. I put it in a thermos jug on my bedside stand. And then I get two cups of coffee, and then I can get out of, out of bed. So when you start talking about caffeine, you really start to stop preaching and begin to meddle. <laughs> well, let's take a look at it. Shall we do that? Caffeine. And what's the favorite drug you put with it? Now, what effect does uh, caffeine have on the central nervous system? It's a stimulant. It's a stimulant. I suppose it, we might call it an upper. Feel a little tired? What do you want? You want a cup of coffee, right? Then you feel a little better. All right, nicotine in small doses, I think, is also a stimulant. But in the doses most of you people have been taking it, it's a tranquilizer. It's a depressant. Now, we know from pharmacology that if you'll take a stimulating drug and you'll combine it with a depressant drug, that it'll produce a euphoria. We see that even in the street drugs. People will take amphetamine, take a barbiturate along with it. So, you know what a euphoria is? Well, when you get up in the morning, how do you feel? In general. Lousy, right? I'll tell you, everyone who's using nicotine and caffeine, when they get up in the morning, they feel lousy. How do you feel today? Lousy. You haven't had your caffeine and you haven't had your nicotine, so you feel lousy. So what's the first thing you go for in a cup in the morning? Cup of coffee, and then a cigarette, and then the euphoria sets in. That means everything is going to be hunky-dory today. God is in his temple. I think this day is going to fly. So we'll put some stars out here, see? do 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 Everything is going to be okay. But did you ever think, okay, we'll get your question in a minute. Get a mic down here, but I want to keep talking while you're doing that. Did you ever think what's going on in the central nervous system? 
Now, I like to ride horses. What do you think if I'd get on my horse and let's say, let's get going, whoa, let's get going, whoa. <laughs> what kind of horse do you think I'd have? <laughs> you think I'd have a nervous, mixed up, irritable horse, huh? How do you feel today? Nervous, mixed up, irritable? You see, you put one drug in and say, let's get going, ting, and put another drug in, let's slow down, tongue. Let's go zing, let's slow down zung, you know. And then pretty soon it goes, nah. Okay. Nicotine, caffeine. And I, do you ever notice that the more you smoke, the more coffee you drink, as a general rule? And they kind of go together. Moonlight and roses, love and marriage, nicotine and caffeine. Yeah. So I keep doing this, you know, and I'm smoking a little extra, drinking a little extra coffee. I'm getting more and more irritable, more and more nervous. But I know how to get rid of that. I have another cigarette, another cup of coffee. I begin to feel a little euphoria till it wears off. Then I get irritable, and then I get nervous, and then I have another one. You see, these drugs are actually illusionary drugs. You know what I mean by an illusion? They make you feel good when you really feel bad. Now you feel lousy, right? You know a cigarette and a, and a cup of coffee would fix it? But your body would still feel lousy. You just feel okay because you don't know what's going on. No, I'm serious. I go out and I break my leg. Will it hurt? Hurt terrible. Doctor comes along, gives me big half grain of morphine. You think the leg will hurt anymore? No. Is the leg still hurting? Yeah. Leg's hurting, but I don't know it. <laughs> you see? So you keep on going, more caffeine, more nicotine, you're getting more nervous. So I come home, I've been in the traffic, and the traffic has been bad, and I've smoked a lot of cigarettes, and I've had a lot of caffeine. Come home, and the wife says, honey, uh, your dinner's ready. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I gotta slow down a little bit. Why don't you fix me a couple of martinis? So I put in here another little drug. What effect does alcohol have on the central nervous system? Yeah, it's a depressant, but so I don't get too depressed, I have another cup of coffee. Now give me some more yin-yang, huh? Make me more nervous. So after a while, I'm having some for lunch, too, because I'm nervous by dinner time. And I keep that up for a few years, and I'm getting actually more nervous, and a little more irritable, more drugs. And finally, one day, the wife says to me, honey, I want you to go see the doctor. I don't need to see the doctor. Listen, even the kids say, what's happened to daddy? He's so irritable and so nervous, I think you better go see the doctor. But there's nothing. Listen to me, please go see the doctor. And on the way to work, I think, well, you know, even the people at work said, how come you show, got such a short fuse? What's going on with you? Maybe I should check in. So I go in and check in with my friendly family physician. He says, well, your blood pressure's up a little bit. Um, I wish you'd cut down on your smoking. Poor foolish physician, he doesn't know that he just gave me an impossible assignment. No one ever cut down on their smoking and stayed cut down for a prolonged period of time that had an established smoking habit. Are you listening to me? It don't work. Have you tried that? And it, did it work? No, it don't, don't work. Anyway, before I leave the office, I say, doctor, but my wife says I'm very nervous. I wonder if you would give me a little And my friendly family physician, not wanting to offend me, sets down and he writes a little prescription, Valium, number 50, 10 milligrams, one TID, and I leave saying, isn't he a good doctor? And what effect does this have on the central nervous system? And so I don't get too depressed, I have another couple of cups of coffee to more and more wreck my nerves. 
Now, if you think I'm joking, this is the great American scene. And until very recently, at least, this was the number one prescription drug. I think now propanolol or one of those beta blockers may head the list. But this was the number one prescription drug in America. Basically, trying to make sense out of what these caused up here, but actually making it worse. And you say, well, why, does your, why would your doctor pres prescribe something that'll make it worse? Well, do you have time to share with me a couple stories from my own office? Would you? Are you trapped? Will you listen? <laughs> okay, these are from my own office. These are not parables. These are actual facts. I treat largely cancer patients. A mother came in with her 18-year-old daughter, was going to M Michigan State University, and she said to me, as I was to give this mother her cancer check, would you talk to my daughter? She's at college, she's not doing well, and she's having these terrible headaches. Well, you know me, I'm a soft touch. And my nurse is shaking her head, no. And I said, yes. Because, you see, we try to keep things running on time. Believe it or not, some doctors do that. 30 minutes for the new patients, 10 minutes for the return patients. And um, the nurse knew that this was going to mess up the schedule. But I figure, mother's here, daughter's here, let's take care of the patient. So mother and daughter come in, and I find out, she says, it's these terrible headaches, doctor, I'm not doing well. And in short order, I had a little history. She'd gone off to college. She'd really taken up smoking pretty good. She joined a few alcohol parties, was getting just a little touch of marijuana now and then. And her diet consisted largely of uh, potato chips and occasional hamburger and she thought Coke was God's original beverage that he provided <laughs> for mankind. And I said to her, honey, it's no wonder you have headaches. Let me put you on a good program. And I kept seeing the nurse walking by as if to kind of say, doctor, hurry it up. The troops are getting nervous. But I'm having fun. I mean, this beats treating cancer, believe me. Here you got a young person, you can perhaps get them on a right kind of program, feel good about yourself. This is what medicine is all about. I love it. And so I'm telling her what she should have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, telling her how to get off those other things, get on an exercise program. I really feel good about myself as a person, and I feel that I'm really doing something worthwhile for her. And finally, I walk out with mother and daughter, and the nurse, nurse breathes a sigh of relief. And just as the mother's about to go, she turns to me and she says, but doctor, I said, yes? Aren't you going to do something for my daughter? <coughs> At that moment, I recognized that the last 45 minutes were down the drain. And I said, like what? And she said, like write her a prescription for Valium or something. Now you see, I can write a prescription for Valium in less than probably two or three seconds, signed my name, and mother and daughter would have left and said, wasn't he a fine physician? I mean, I really appreciate old Doc Weaver. I don't know what they said when they left, but I suspect it was something like this. What was he, some kind of a naturopath quack or what? <laughs> Why does your doctor write prescriptions for Valium? Keeps the troops happy but it doesn't help the situation. Okay, I'll share another story with you. Lady came to my office. She sat on my examining table, eyes darting hither and thither. I spoke quietly because I was afraid if I'd make any noise, she would scream and run out. I mean, she was this nervous. She says, doctor, I'm afraid I got cancer. Well, she might should have had. She had all the lifestyle that goes along with it, smoking, cigarettes, alcohol, she drank a ton of caffeine and the like. And I checked her over, and I didn't find any cancer. And I said, I have good news for you. Oh, thank you, she said. I said, I don't find any cancer. But I said, you're a nervous wreck. She says, I know it, but I shouldn't be. I already had the story of the smoking, the alcohol, the caffeine. So the next question I asked her, I knew no one that nervous wasn't on tranquilizers. I said, 
what tranquilizers are you taking? She said, Doctor, I'm not sure which of these tablets are tranquilizers. These are the pills I'm taking. She opened her purse and she put actually 12 vials on my desk. Three of them were major tranquilizers. And then she had things to undo what the tranquilizers did. She had things to wake her up in the morning and things to put her to sleep at night. She had stuff to move her bowels and stuff to stop diarrhea. She, she had the waterfront covered. And I said to her, would you like to feel better? She said, that's a foolish question, doctor. Of course I'd like to feel better. I said, good, I have a prescription for you. And she brightened. And I took out my prescription pad and I wrote, number one, stop smoking. She says, you're kidding. I said, no. Number two, stop drinking. She said, I might be able to do that. Number three, stop your caffeine. She said, no way. <laughs> and I said, number four, please leave all these pills with me. She says, those cost me a ton of money. You think I'm going to leave them here? I said, I thought you said you wanted to feel better. I do, she said, but it wouldn't work. I said, I guarantee it. She says, you're kidding. I said, I'm not kidding. Well, after some give and take, she finally said to me, well, I suppose I could try. Well, I was making a little progress. She left her pills. And I gave her an appointment for one month. I really didn't expect to see her again. But one month later, she was back. And the nurse who had put her in the room didn't know any of this conversation I'd had with her except for the cancer exam, came to me and she said, what did you give that lady? I said, I didn't give that lady anything. She says, she sure looks a lot better and acts a lot better. I walked in, she sat there on the examining table, tranquil, relaxed, equanimous, beautiful. And I said to her, how do you feel? She said, doctor, I hate to tell you this, but I haven't felt this good since I was a teenager. I said, wow. Now you know the answer. And she looked at me and she said, well, yes and no. I said, what do you mean, yes and no? Well, she says, you know what? I don't need to smoke anymore. I don't need to drink anymore. You can keep those miserable pills, but doctor, I got to have my coffee. <laughs> I spent the next 20 minutes trying to talk her out of her coffee. But she left there saying, I'm going to have my coffee. Well, she hasn't been back. But you know, I could write the sequel. Because when she went back on her coffee, you know what she got? She got a little nervous. And when you get a little nervous, you know what you do? You smoke. And now you've got your yin, and you've got your yang, and you've got your nervousness back in very short order. And then she had to have a little alcohol somewhere down the line. And then she wanted her Valium. You think she's going to come ask me for it? No way. No way. She'll go back to her friendly family physician who will sit down and write Valium, TID, sign his name, isn't he a good doctor? From my own office, these stories. I hope you're getting a point. Let's talk a little bit about caffeine. I've called... Um, Caffeine, the penny behind the fuse. But let's take a little look at it first. Let's say this is our alertness level, okay? It's not quite straight, but this is, this is how wide awake we'd like to be during the day. When you get up in the morning, where are you? Up here, down here, or right on the line? Yeah, now there are people, I'll admit, to come leaping out of bed and say, whoopee, what a day, let's go. Now, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not a caffeine user. But let me tell you that even in the morning when I wake up, I kind of look at my girl and say, what time is it, honey? Take a big yawn. But the average person, what do they head for? Coffee and usually a cigarette. Now, that gives you a kick up, right? Is that real or artificial? 
It's a fake out. It's illusionary. You're no more awake there than you were down here. You know how I know? Because as soon as that caffeine begins to wear off, you know what happens? Down it goes. Take me to any institution in the country at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning and I'll tell you where the coffee is and not have to inquire. You believe that? All I do is watch the flow of traffic. It's like ants coming and going to a drop piece of cake on a picnic. As people come back to get their mid-morning fix because they're beginning to feel sleepy and tired again. And so throughout the day, till they collapse into bed at night, always in debt to themselves. Is that the way you feel tonight, in debt? Yeah, you are in debt. Because you see, listen carefully, I took away your illusion. And now you know how tired you are all the time. It's true. All I did was take away the drug that was fooling you and let you see how tired and how bad and irritable your system really is. All right, the penny behind the fuse, caffeine. Now, I grew up in a little town called Holly. Any of you heard of that little town? Down the road of spit and a holler? Well, we had a volunteer fire department and a few things like that there. Interesting little town. And um, that, back in those days, you remember people were getting all those electrical appliances when I was a kid growing up. Have you heard of mangles? Do you remember what those were? You, you put your sheets in that, and they'd do your sheets, and people were getting rid of their ice boxes and getting re refrigerators. And our neighbor was getting all these things and plugging them in, and the fuses kept blowing. Foot, 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 foot. And someone said, I'll tell you what to do. Get, you know, those are screw-in type fuses. Take and put a penny behind the fuse and screw it in and you won't have any trouble. So they did that. They stuck a penny behind the fuse, they screwed it in and voila, everything worked. And they said, wow, that's good. It was about a week later, Saturday morning, heard the fire siren go off down in the village hall. If you want to get attention in a small town, have a fire. Did you ever see a crowd following an electrician's truck that was going around to put in extra circuits? No, no, no. Have a fire, and then you can get attention. OK? Every woman's got her head out the door. Kids are on their bicycles. And here comes the little volunteer firemen. They've got their sirens going and their little lights going. Everybody's going to the fire. Well. It's a little bit the same way in medicine. Do you know that? We'll talk about, the, about that in a minute. But let's talk about the fuse that God has put in you. Here it is. Have you heard of that? Fatigue. When your fatigue light comes on, what do you need? Sleep. What do you usually head for? You head for the coffee pot. You put the penny behind the fuse. And you screw it in, right? It's a little bit like the oil light on my car. I got that crazy light, and it comes on, and it says, ooh, you, ooh, you, ooh, you, ooh, you. I find that very annoying. So you know what I did? I disconnected the wires. <laughs> Dumb idea or smart idea? Now I've got you. Listen carefully. I believe it's dumber to disconnect the fatigue light on my body than it is to disconnect the oil light on my car. Because last time I checked, they were passing out bodies one to the person. And when that one was shot, there isn't any left. But as long as I can come up with enough money, I can find somebody that will sell me a car. You believe that? So I would suggest it's dumber to disconnect the fatigue light on your body than it is to disconnect the oil light on your car because, listen carefully, your body will break down eventually in its weakest point just as your car will break down in its weakest point without oil if you're not giving your body adequate sleep. Now the reason that we think we're getting away with it is that our bodies are so fearfully and wonderfully made 
that we can abuse them and abuse them and they keep on going and it isn't until way down the line that we find we're in deep trouble. If my weakest point is my brain and I keep, don't get the adequate rest I need, I keep pouring the caffeine in, I'll have my nervous breakdown. You've heard, seen that sign. I deserve it, I have it coming and no one can deprive me from it. <laughs> Do you know that the psychiatrists actually have a, a, a disease uh, diagnosis they call caffeinism? And it frequently takes place irritability, an inability to sleep, waking up at funny times, nervousness, irritability, brought on by what? Caffeine. If my weak point is my heart, I get a heart attack. And there are some pretty good studies. The best one I know of was taken years ago when they took a medical school class and they kept track of those that were using coffee and those that weren't. A lot more heart attacks in those people who were using coffee than in those people who didn't. Huh? It's dangerous to have your heart attack nowadays. It used to be people would give you mouth to mouth. They won't do that anymore. <laughs> They're afraid of the age, you know that? So they may just leave you there on the street or just thump it on your chest, something like that. Well, I know that it's popular because, I mean, who are you if you haven't had a bypass, right? <clears throat> or uh, one of those balloons they put up there and try to dilate those... Uh, vessels, but listen, don't you think your heart needs a rest too? If it's your stomach, and you know that caffeine increases the acid in your stomach, makes you much more likely to have duodenal ulcers, well, you can, of course, have your stomach out, or you can take some menadine, or caraphate, or some of those antacids, try to fix it. Hey, but don't you think it would be ideal to let your stomach sort of relax and enjoy life as it is? Fatigue. Caffeine is not a good drug. It's been associated with fibrocystic disease of the breast. I believe it may be associated with prostate hypertrophy in men. There are some suggestions that even some types of cancer may be associated with it. It's not a good drug. It's the commonest cause of headache. Usually on the withdrawal, but it can also be on the rise. How many got a headache here tonight? Quite a few of you. Yeah, that could be a caffeine withdrawal headache. You know how to get rid of it? Stop your caffeine. I've had patients that come to me because I do mostly head and neck cancer. They got this terrible headache pain. They think they may have a cancer. First thing I do is take them off their caffeine. Ninety percent of them will never have a headache again. There are other causes of headache, quite a few of them. Don't misunderstand me. But it's interesting to me that the day after surgery, everyone complains of a big headache. You know what they think it's due to? The anesthetic. Do you know what it's due to? We don't put the coffee in the IVs. <laughs> and you know what the first thing the patient asks for when you tell him he can eat? I want my coffee, doctor, because I'm addicted. But our drug companies are very clever. They put the caffeine in the headache relieving medicine. So that works real good. It takes away your headache. It sets you up for the next headache. And it takes away that headache, too. And you know you can sell a lot of drugs that way? Anison, APCs, all those caffeine uh, containing um, compounds. Now, let me ask the question. I'm trying to make you feel better about being off that coffee for a little bit, huh? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But it's not a good drug. The only, I guarantee you, if you'd go to the FDA and try to get approval for it, you couldn't do it today, you know that? But you know why it's, everybody's addicted, including the people on the FDA, right? <laughs> so they're not gonna do, they're not gonna do away with caffeine. They're gonna let you continue on your illusion while you pull the fatigue light on your body. The good news is that those of you who are off your coffee, in three days your headaches will be gone and you'll be awake. Now, people have asked me, I won't get that question yet before we go. People ask me, doctor, how can you wake up if you don't give your coffee? Now, let me tell you a good method to wake up. Don't do this if you have heart disease, okay? 
But if you don't have heart disease, this is what I do every morning. One good way is to get up and do a little exercise. Hmm? That'll get the blood flowing, get you awake. Well, you say, I don't have time to exercise in the morning. Well, here's what you do. You go to the shower. Oh, a nice warm shower. You can even sing in there a little bit, you know. It's a nice, I, I use my showers for therapy, you know. Sure, therapy, not just to uh, get clean, but therapy. Nice warm water. You run that around, you soap down, that feels good. But you're not quite awake yet. But here's what you do. Without giving it too much thought, you turn and you face the faucets. With one hand, you turn off the hot water. With the other hand, you turn on the cold water. When you get that hot water off and that cold water hits you, you'll know the day has started. <laughs> you will even start some deep breathing right there in the shower. <laughs> you may even have a little exercise going. <laughs> then you turn around and you take that on your back. Then you get a couple hands full and you splash that on your face. By now, the day is fully started. You shut off the cold water, you get a towel and you polish. You come out of there glowing and wide awake. You say, doctor, forget it. <coughs> it works. I guarantee if you do it for a month, you'll never quit it. Now, I should tell you, share something with you about people who won't listen to doctors. There's two people that won't pay any attention to doctors. One of them are nurses. <laughs> and the other one, doctor's wives. You got it. Now, my wife is a nurse. <laughs> so that should tell you something right there, see? Now, one day I came home, and she was acting pretty perky and kind of went, ah, do 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 all right, I said, I know you've got something you want to tell me. What is it? I can't tell you. You'll have to find out for yourself. Do, 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 do. You know how that game goes? And after a while, I said, all right, honey, what is it? Oh, she says, you wouldn't believe it, but I took a cold shower. And you know what, she said? It wasn't that bad. You know what? She's still taking cold showers. And you know how I know? Sometimes she gets there before me. And when I turn on the water, you know what I get? I get a sandwich job, cold in front, warm in between, and cold on the end, because she's got the pipes all full with the cold water system. Now, if I can convince my nurse wife, maybe I can convince you to try it. This is a natural stimulant. This is not an illusion. This is real stuff. <laughs> this will make you alert and alive and awake and ready to go. But don't forget to polish with a towel, huh? Does that get your skin stimulated? You try it, and you like it. All right, now I'll answer your question about the caffeine. I don't believe that a decaffeinated beverage, it's not a health beverage, okay? I'll, let's start with that. The caffeine all itself is irritating to the gaf gastric mucosa. That's the flavoring agent that comes in the caffeine. And even uh, some studies show that it will kick up your cholesterol level. Maybe you read that study, the decaffeinated coffee. But in addition to this, while you're stopping smoking at least, I don't want you to use it because when that smell comes curling up, you know what it's going to say? Cigarette, cigarette, cigarette. I like the coffee. Where is the cigarette, cigarette? Psychological association that you won't get from a glass of fruit juice, okay? Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you've put in one night already, right? right. right. You've got one third of the misery behind you, right. Right? right? Now, those of you who aren't off yet, how would you like to get on board? Will you do that? Do not stop coming back. In any case, we'll get you off. I got a special session for you tomorrow night. But I think, oh, we need the buttons. Okay, here we come. Everybody that hasn't smoked in the last 24 hours, you stand, and we're going to give you a button before you go. Stand right up. Everybody who hasn't smoked in the last 24 hours. <laughs>